Cricket has evolved over a 250 year period. Most sports are lucky to have 100 years of history. And ours is so old, we don't actually know where the name cricket comes from. Wait a minute. So that means many things from our sport have been passed down from a different world. In fact, in some ways, a different sport. And some of these have held up really well. Like, this is going to sound weird because no one really seems to see it this way, but making it a five-day sport was actually a pretty good idea from a ticket perspective, and then from a TV and a streaming perspective. Also, the white clothing became a defining image of the game. And even many of the random old laws were quite handy. Like, for instance, LBW came from the time when, in the late 1700s, we rolled the ball on the ground. I think, quite obviously, our sport would be much worse if LBW wasn't part of it. So over the years, many great things have come from our game being so old and weird and growing in so many different ways. Even the MCC and their laws have often been well behind the way the game has developed and moved. It's evolved by being played in the UK and then by being played around the world, which is different again. But there are many things that have happened that you simply wouldn't do today. It took us over 100 years to put players' names on their back, despite the fact that the players are so far away on a cricket field. You meet 100 metres away, we dressed them all identically, and then we didn't allow anyone to actually work out who was who. That's the thing that if cricket was designed now, you would never do that. So I wanted to come at this from a different angle, because knowing what we know now, if you had the chance of redesigning Test Cricket, what kind of changes would you make? So I threw out a tweet, and uh, I got a lot of responses. This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. There were obviously a lot of people saying, now, no changes, it's perfect, which is nonsense. It will continually change like it always has. If you think it's perfect now, that took years and years and years of subtle little changes and sometimes massive changes within our game to get it that way. And the way that it is played will change. That means the people who are running it will have to continually change it. That's just a normal thing. Like, for instance, if you love the fact that Test Cricket goes for five days, that's like a reasonably new thing. It wasn't really until the 80s that that became uniform. And even now we've gone back to four days occasionally, right? And of course there were other people saying that, oh, you should just make it 20 overs or 100 balls. Yeah, we did that. But we still have Test Cricket, which is a product that is worth a lot of money. So I tried to begin with the point of what would be different if we just designed Test Cricket today, let's say a Premier Test League, knowing everything that we know. So let's start with the toss because this one was certainly mentioned a lot. I didn't do stats on it, but I suggest that this was the most consistent reply. Many sports have coin tosses, but in most of them, it plays little, if not no difference in the game. We just know that that isn't the case in cricket, right? Many people went with maybe the most obvious suggestion, that the travelling team get to choose what they want to do instead of tossing a coin. That has actually been tried before, um, most recently I think in county cricket, and they gave up on it. I can only assume it didn't work. But at the same time, Derek Willis tweeted in to mention his piece with Gaurav Sood on why teams should be able to make an auction for the toss. Which is quite a radical change to the way we think about it, but it's probably far more fair and far more logical than the way we currently play cricket. Even just allowing the touring captain to make the decision is still probably a much better option than we, what we currently have in cricket. And that's because most of us know that the toss isn't particularly fair. So that's why I began with this, because if you started Test Cricket today, I just don't think we would have a toss in the way that we currently do in cricket matches. The toss is quite a big one, but there was a lot of quite small and interesting ones that I found, like this one from Noah, who was talking about the fact that the batting team should be allowed to decline the extra delivery after a no ball. Again, we are assuming that the batting team wants the extra delivery, but if you're batting out a draw, you don't. If you're a number 11 facing Jasper Bumrah, you don't. I, this is a really interesting one for me, because sometimes a batting team can be penalized by the no ball. Other people suggested free hits for no balls. Free hits were probably one of the best inventions of modern cricket, as they did two things. They radically reduced the number of no balls, and also people love the idea of a free hit. I don't know if we need free hits in test cricket. I'd probably prefer the back foot no ball call with an amendment to stop bowlers dragging their foot. Let's talk weather, because this game gets some, and then we can't play anymore. It's not the only sport bothered by rain. Obviously, baseball and tennis are two other ones. But there's no way that you design a sport right now and allow it to be so heavily affected by the rain as we do in cricket. The obvious answer is roofs on grounds. And there's no way that cricket would ever be able to afford to have a roof on every single ground. But one per country is probably possible into the future, right? But that still leaves a lot of cricket that won't be covered by the rain. And I saw at least one person suggest that the Sri Lanka method of covering the entire ground is the best option. At the very least, that would lessen the time that we have to wait before coming back on. But surely the perfect thing would be to play through light rain. 
And we can't do that at the moment because it ruins the ball and also can ruin the pitch or at least change the pitch so, so much so that it's not really worth playing anymore. But the only way to be able to do that, of course, is to make the ball out of something that isn't leather. And that's a problem because the degradation of the ball is part of the game. It's supposed to start shiny and new and then get worse as the game goes on. And none of this is even mentioning Jason Gillespie's point here, where we probably don't need to kill animals to play our sport, right? But it's not just the ball that would be a problem with light rain. The other thing would be the pitches. The thing is, we've actually already started looking at hybrid pitches. I don't think for test cricket we would ever go to them, but I think they will end up being regularly used in white ball games. But here's why I think that's slightly important. If we use them more in white ball games, the curators won't have to worry about the pitches as much. That would actually improve the quality of the pitch. At the moment, there is so much cricket being played across any square of any professional cricket ground that the pitches are generally just not as good as they should be. If you had a couple of hybrid synthetic pitches there, the ground keepers wouldn't have to spend as much time on those wickets, plus they could be reused a lot more. Of course, that still doesn't help us with playing more in the rain, but I can't do everything. And of course, we've already moved on from the rain, really, haven't we? And we're talking about pitches here. And if you don't want to go all the way with synthetic wickets, and I really think that that's a bit tricky for test cricket, what about independent pitch curators? We already have independent umpires, and the pitch plays a bigger role than the umpires, right? So it would make sense to do that. In fact, just talking about the umpires for a moment, it's probably also worth mentioning the third umpires. At the moment, if you're a third umpire, you do it a third of your time. That means we don't have third umpires who are specialists. Most other sports now have TV umpires or whatever, review umpires, whatever they call them, that are specialists. They understand the technology. They understand what to look for. They work with the TV companies all the time, and they're much better at their job. Too often now, there just seems to be errors when it goes to the third umpire. That's just an easy fix. That's not even a redesign, is it? It's just a little, just a little, just third umpires and normal umpires, two different species. But to get back to the original point, if you were redesigning test cricket from scratch, you might well not use a leather ball that goes out of shape all the time or an outfield made of real turf that is hard to drain or a pure grass wicket. The idea if you're redesigning it today is you would want the sport to be played more often, right? And I suppose that takes us to overrates. Now, overrates, most people talked about penalties for overrates for the bowling team. I still think we're talking about overrates completely wrong. The reason that teams don't bowl over 90 overs that often isn't just the bowling team. The batters are just as much involved in this, and the way that the game is played, and also DRS, is a huge factor in all this now. This is one of those things that if you're redesigning a sport, you want to win eliminate, that the constant chat about overrates, because it makes your game look silly when you don't have to. So I don't care what the new system is, but if you're redesigning test cricket, that's certainly something you'd have to look at because you would want as much cricket possible. And that also comes in with rain, as we've already discussed, and light. We stop for a bunch of reasons that would make another sport blush. And I think we obviously have to stop for bad light when it gets unsafe. But the real point is making sure that the game is always safe, even in lower light levels. For instance, if it does get dark, we could turn the lights on. That means if you were designing test cricket from today, we probably wouldn't be using red balls because they don't work under the lights. They create a shadow, it confuses the batter, they're not easy to see, the fielders don't like them. So that would mean an investment in the pink ball or I don't know, somehow finally working out how to make the white ball decent or another color altogether. And that's quite radical, but we also wanna play more cricket, right? And if we were able to fix the ball, we'd be able to fix something else quite big as well. Day-night matches would absolutely be part of your plan if you are redesigning cricket today. In fact, right now, the majority of test cricket is played midweek during the day when the advertising rates are low and most people are working or at school. And one of the most obvious reasons that day-night tests are not a thing is because cricket started before electrification. Also, lighting a cricket around was very tough. The technology really had to move on. It's way different than, say, a baseball diamond. So there is no doubt that if you're redesigning it from today, there would be far more day-night matches. So far in cricket, we haven't really invested what we should into that. But if you started from scratch, that's where you'd begin. And that's kind of the beginning, right? If you were looking at day-night matches, the other thing you'd be looking at would be four-day tests. This would allow you to play three tests in three weeks with matches being played from Thursday to Sunday. If you do that as a day-night game, it means you hit Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights. Good for ratings. Also, it means if you have a close test, it would finish on a Sunday evening when a lot of people are probably around and in front of their streaming devices or TV or whatever it may be. This is basically the golf model, right? But it works. People know when a golf tournament ends. From a cricket perspective, it works on a few different levels. It would massively help the scheduling of matches. Obviously, we'd have to fit a few more extra overs into a day. Players would play longer days but have slightly longer recovery. 
And there are issues because a five day match is something special in itself because of what the pitch does. But making sure the majority of test matches in the world were actually played over the weekend when people are free to watch them is probably worth it. And if you've got all these day night, four day games finishing on a Sunday, the next thing to add to this is a league. Many people in the mentions talked about two or three divisions or giving status to everyone. I actually think the, the best thing is probably a combination of both of those ideas. Everyone gets to play test cricket. Let's end this nonsensical private boys club of test cricket. If you are an international team and you want to play a test, you are allowed to play a test. But there are divisions because that is how sport should work. You should have to earn your trip to the top. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, West Indies, England, India, all these early teams, you shouldn't get to just stay in division one of test cricket because you played it like a hundred years ago, right? Just because some person thought it was a nice place to go on holiday occasionally. You earn your right to go at the top. But if you're an international team, you should also automatically qualify to play a test match if you want to. The idea of international sport is that you prove yourself to be worthy to be at the top level at all time. Not just because some old fella 120 years ago was like, it'd be nice to have a holiday in Cape Town. Now, if you were really organizing this from scratch, would you still make test cricket nations-based or would you go the franchise model? We've almost had this once when Lalit Modi was involved with a rebel group at one point. And it does make sense. If you think about it, we probably never have the 100 or 200 best test players playing. There are some teams that produce more than 11 of the best test players. And there are other teams that probably produce only one or two test quality players, but they can't play because their nation is not a test nation. If you really want test cricket to be the best players versus the best, a franchise league is quite clearly a better option. It would also probably make it easier to pay each player what they deserve to be paid. They'd be paid based on their skills, not on their nationality. You can be a very average test player in, let's say, England or Australia and get paid a lot more than Shaky Balasan when he was actually the best all-rounder in the world for a good period of time. And, that, and once there is a market for test skills, that means that a lot of players would start to choose to make their money that way rather than just going towards T20. It would allow players to choose their best format rather than having to follow the money at all times. Now, it would be a very bold move to go away from what had made test cricket work in the first place. But there are just so many problems with the way that nation v nation work. Again, I'm not saying we should scrap test cricket as it currently stands, but if we were starting from scratch, franchises make a lot of sense. Whether it was at internationals or whether it was franchise, if you did have a proper league, you would actually have someone finally running test cricket. At the moment, no one is in charge of the test game. Certainly not the ICC, not the BCCI, not no one. And so many of the problems that we have within the game just aren't fixed because no one is in charge. Leagues have to be run by someone. That's pretty big, those last changes. So let's just come down to some smaller stuff again. Many people talked about taking away the limit on bounces, essentially making sure that test cricket is a battle royale type sport. And I do get it, but I don't think if we were redesigning this from today, if we know everything we do about CTE and duty of care, that we'd suddenly allow this to become a blood sport. No one sent anything about bails, but people have suggested to me before that we should remove bails from international cricket. We now have technology that lets us know, most of the time anyway, if the ball has hit the stumps. But we also know that the ball can sometimes hit the stumps quite hard and the bails don't fall, and other times it hits quite softly and the bails do fall. I personally am okay with this. But again, if we're starting from scratch, I'm not sure that we need this 200 year relic when we have technology that is far more advanced than that. Bales will always be part of cricket because obviously at the lower level, that's not a problem. But at the test level, if you've got someone steaming in and actually smacking the ball into the stumps and the bales don't fall, I can see why these people feel that way. Here's another one that was brought up quite a lot. We are still shaping our game around lunch breaks when we're actually in the year 2022. We need breaks, but surely they need to be of equal time and flexible. It's incredible that we still haven't got to that point. And let me finish with a favorite of mine that I originally came up with when it comes to T20. But it also works in test cricket. As we were talking about before, we know at the moment that test cricket is not really the best against the best. And there's a few different reasons for that. One is the nation-based model. One currently is the financial model as well. But there are ways that you can glam up the contest on the field to make it a lot more the best versus the best. For instance, do we really need number 11s facing a part-time spinner in a test match? We could give test cricket teams a bench. And I'm not talking about injury subs here. That's too easy to cheat. And outside of blood and concussions, I don't think there are many, if any, professional sports that allow injury substitutes. Generally, they have benches. And I promise that on any day ending with a Y, I could find an injury to sub out every fast bowler in the world. They're always injured. What I'm talking about is a real bench. 
The history of substitutions in football is actually quite interesting. But in truth, while they had it in football as far back as the 1850s, in-game changes didn't come about to the 1950s, and rugby was even later again. The idea of substitutes in English sports didn't really exist. It was the American sports that had benches. So that means that cricket, which was the dominant sport for 100, 150 years, would have seen no reason to ever have a bench. And you might like part-timers and number 11s. And the question is, is would you devise this game from scratch to send out players who cannot bat at all to face fast bowling? It's a fantastic quirk of our game, but I'm not sure you'd start with it from now. Not to mention that if a bowler gets injured in a game, it makes that game very lopsided. And yes, on occasion, the team with the injury can still come back and win, and it's magnificent. More often than not, if one of your four or five bowlers goes down, you're in trouble. But also, this is more about how we talk about cricket, right? I would say most of the conversations we have about cricket via the media and the fans is about who is in the team and who is not in the team. It's a five-day game. We have seven days of moaning about the selection. And that's not even mentioning how often teams just misread the pitch. I want it to be very clear. I'm not talking about the stupid super sub rule of ODI cricket or the one that the Big Bash has. I'm saying let's change it so that every team has a bench with two quicks, a couple of new ball seamers and every kind of spinner they want. Maybe a keeper who specializes in quicks standing back and another one who stands up at the stumps. And we haven't even got to all the different things you could do with batters. You could have unlimited substitutions. You could have three substitutions per game, whatever you wanted. But depending on how far you pushed it, you could have the best seven or eight bowlers on the team going up against the best 11 batters from the opposition. Truly best versus best. And as much as I love test cricket and the quirky way that it has developed over the years, there are so many changes that we could make. In fact, one that I haven't really talked about here is we might just have a split one day, like what happened with rugby or motor racing. Test cricket might be a sport on its own. And at that stage, some of these things might be looked at. I don't know how many of these will ever occur. And there's certainly no rush at the moment to redesign test cricket from anyone I can see. Most of the things that happen to our five day game at the moment are just dirty bandages on an open wound, right? But one thing I know about this game is that it has always changed. And if it hadn't changed, we wouldn't even like it as much as we would. It's just that test cricket usually changes a little bit at a time, which is why my suggestions are slightly more radical. Than